um, everyone find a seat. Huh. <laughs> All right, uh, we should be fine to go. Um, let's see. All right, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, uh, and welcome to the New York Studio School's virtual evening lecture series. Uh, tonight, it was my great pleasure to be um, presenting Sydney Babcock Monumental Miniatures, Cylinder Seals of Ancient Mesopotamia, 3300 to 500 BC. Um, I would like to uh, just quickly say before I go into our thank yous that um, tonight, uh, Mr. Babcock will be presenting some of the seals in the collection of the Morgan Library and Museum. Um, the lecture of monumental miniatures, cylinder seals of ancient Mesopotamia, 3300 to 500 BC. Um, and this lecture re replaces the originally scheduled lecture about women in Mesopotamia. Um, that lecture was to be given in, conju in conjunction with Sydney's exhibition, She Who Wrote, Inhead Duana and Women of Mesopotamia from 3300 to 2000 BC. Um, but that exhibition had to be postponed due to the international travel restrictions in place uh, this last August. Um, so we are really looking forward to that exhibition next year. Um, and it, it is scheduled for October 15th, 2022. And uh, we will also really look forward to having Sydney back then to give a, a lecture on that original um, topic and his exhibition. Um, so I would like to quickly uh, thank everyone for joining us um, for tonight's lecture. And I would really like to thank uh, Sydney for um, pivoting. And uh, this, uh, this is a topic that we have discussed quite at length at the studio school and um, teachers and students have worked from these seals, which are quite powerful and we're very excited about it. I would uh, also like to just quickly recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, as well as many individual contributors. Um, please do consider making a donation either during, during or after tonight's talk by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.nyss.org. Um, I will also just quickly say that we have just a few more lectures left in our uh, season this year. Um, we come back from Thanksgiving break. Uh, so please, if, uh, if you like, register for one of the remaining talks. All right, uh, we will leave some time for Q and A at the end of the lecture, and you'll see at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button. Please do put your questions into there and I will uh, address them at the end, but put them in at any time and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, all right. I'll, again, we're so excited to have um, monumental miniatures, cylinder seals of ancient Mesopotamia, 3300 to 500 BC. Um, and just to introduce our speaker tonight, Sydney Babcock is the Jeanette and Jonathan Rosen Curator and Department Head of Ancient Near Eastern Seals and Tablets at the Morgan Library and Museum. He has been at the Morgan for 26 years. Uh, Sydney is a world-renowned specialist in the ancient seals of Mesopotamia. He considers it the great privilege of his professional career to be responsible for interpreting the Morgan's collection of ancient Mesopotamian seals for the general public. He is the second curator of seals at the Morgan following the legendary Edith Parada, with whom he studied at Columbia University. He has collaborated on exhibitions of ancient seals in both Europe and America and written extensively for these exhibitions. His most recent exhibition at the Morgan was Noah's Beasts, Sculpted Animals from Ancient Mesopotamia, 3300 to 2250 BC. Uh, in the summer of 2017, a remarkable exhibition that the New Yorker called uh, breathtaking. So with that, uh, please join me in a virtual welcome of Sydney Babcock. Thank you, Sam. And we'll start immediately 
On the screen is what appears to be a large sculpture relief carved with great detail. It dates to around the seventh century BC during the time of the Neo-Babylonians and the legendary Nebuchadnezzar. The scene depicts a demonic lion facing a winged superhuman hero. The lion's threatening gestures and the tension in the span of his sharp claws suggests his evil power, but the hero will be the victor. Taller than the lion, he acts with a calm force, and the bull, the victim or prize of the contest, remains in his power. As the hero extends his step to assert his dominance, the smooth muscular forms of the human leg are set off by the carefully detailed flounced garment, which opens to reveal its fine inside embroidered ornamentation. Despite the violence in the action, the figure seems suspended in time, a result of the symmetry of the composition. This image of a heroic being protecting a domesticated animal from an attacking lion has a long tradition in Mesopotamia and is first visualized, as we shall see, thousands of years earlier. Here on the screen, in all its majestic grandeur, the image represents the culmination of several thousand years of Mesopotamian art. However, the relief on the screen is in reality only about an inch high and was made by me rolling a stone cylinder as shown on the left onto a soft material on the right. In the miniature space of the seal, the artist has created a contest of monumental proportions. This is the magnificent monumental miniature world of ancient Mesopotamian cylinder seals. And this evening, I hope to share with you the beauty and importance of these seals and the insights they offer about Mesopotamia. The story is one of the rise and fall of successive political entities, as well as the continuity of artistic endeavors throughout this turbulent time of some three millennia. First, let us begin and orient ourselves. On the left is a map of the modern boundaries of the region and the land that the ancient Greeks called Mesopotamia or the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. You are all now familiar with this map showing the modern state of Iraq from the news over the last several decades or so. But what you may or may not know is that the great ancient sites of the late fourth and third millennium BC are mostly concentrated in the south. Among these sites is the most famous of all and perhaps the earliest city in the Ur, in the world, Ur. On the right, is a satellite view of the region. Turkey is to the north, where the Tigris and the Euph and Euphrates have their sources. And here is the great floodplain of southern Mesopotamia. In this region, from the border with Turkey in the north all the way to the south, the level of the land changes only about 30 feet. The land is awesomely flat. It was the slow progression of the two mighty rivers that created this flat landscape, a landscape constantly changing due to the frequent changes in the river courses themselves at the whim of rainstorms and floods. While the alluvial soil was extremely fertile, the water had to be controlled by vast irrigation systems which emerged in the region before 4000 BC. This is no small accomplishment. When one thinks of the difficulty we still have today managing the floods of our own great rivers, such as the Ohio and the Mississippi. Now, the availability of raw materials is an historic fact of great importance, as is the dependence on those materials that had to be imported. In Mesopotamia, agricultural products and those from livestock breeding, as shown above, and fisheries and date palm cultivation and reed industries, as shown below in a building made of reeds, were available in plenty and could easily be produced in excess of home requirements to be exported. On the other hand, wood, stone, metal were rare or even entirely lacking. Consequently, Mesopotamia was destined to be a land of trade from the start. The raw material that epitomizes Mesopotamian civilization is mud, an entire civilization based on clay, as shown on the left and used in the almost exclusively mud brick architecture as shown here on the right in the great ziggurat of Ur, as it still dominates landscape over 4,000 years after it was constructed. And nowhere 
Mesopotamia bears the clay as does no other civilization and nowhere in the world but in Mesopotamia. And the regions over which its influence was diffused was clay used as the vehicle for writing. Such phrases as cuneiform civilization, cuneiform literature, and cuneiform law can only apply where people held the idea of using soft clay, not only for bricks and jars and for the jar stoppers on which a seal could be impressed as a mark of ownership, but also as the vehicle for impressed signs to which established meanings were then assigned an intellectual achievement that amounted to nothing less than the invention of writing. And above all, the literature of Mesopotamia is one of its finest cultural achievements. Just think of the Epic of Gilgamesh. On the left is one of these ancient jar ceilings dated to the Akkadian period around 2250 BC. Notice the lion here struggling with a hero, another lion over here and a hero and an inscription. That this piece of unbaked clay survives is remarkable, as is the quality of the seal that was used to impress it, and now lost sometime in the remotest past. On the right is an actual sun-dried cuneiform tablet from the Morgan Library dating to the mid-second millennium BC. What I will show you this evening will be from the Morgan Library Museum and currently on view in the library's north room, unless I tell you otherwise. The tablet is less than four inches high, as in as in and is impressed here, or signed, as it were, or authenticated with a seal in order to, as I said, authenticate the text of the tablet. It's to these masterpieces in miniature, the cylinder seals, that I will now turn. On the screen are a number of these cylinder seals. Again, the largest of these is less than an inch and a half high. They're among the smallest objects ever produced by sculptures. You can immediately see the beauty in the variety of materials such as white and colored marbles, lapis lazuli, carnelian, agates, variety of chalcedonies, among others. Notice the holes at the tops. The seals were drilled through so they could be worn, and indeed, a primary function of these seals was amuletic. A particular stone was thought to have a specific property that would have a beneficial effect on its wearer. For us today, Cylinder seals are the most important artifact for the understanding of the visual reality of ancient Mesopotamia. As I have told you, there is little or no stone in Mesopotamia, so the raw materials that make up these seals had to be imported from great distances, such as Nubia, far to the west, and northern Afghanistan, even further to the east. But more important than that, because of this lack of stone, there is little monumental stone architecture or quantities of stone sculpture that attest to the achievements and sophistication of the ancient cultures of, shall we say, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. The images engraved on these seal stones represent nothing less than the largest body of pictorial information that survives from ancient Mesopotamia. If you think of the information found on painted Greek pottery, the myths, God's daily life, an entire repertoire of images and well, the same occurs on cylinder seals, but instead of being painted on breakable pottery in vogue for several hundred years as in Greece, these images engraved on durable stone provide us today with a unique chronological and artistic sequence for well over 3,000 years. Moreover, a seal had a direct relationship to a particular individual, for the seal identified what it was used to seal, a vessel, a sack, a box, a storeroom, a temple door, a tablet as the property or the responsibility of a specific person. To that extent, seals represent the earliest pictorial representation of a person. Every time a seal was used and pressed on clay or on a tablet, the image would be repeated and thus seen by numerous people, much like a postage stamp combined with a photo ID today. The propaganda value of these repeated images was not lost on our ancestors. As I have mentioned, Steels were worn. Here on the right is a drawing of a shell inlay showing a woman wearing a seal suspended from her garment pins and at the original of the Metropolitan Museum. Here's her garment pin and there's her seal dangling down. And here on the left is how the great Lady Puabi was found in her tomb at the Royal Cemetery of Ur in the late 1930s, showing her garment pins with her seals as found. This is her headdress like this over here, 
Her shoulders were here. The body has been removed and all the garments. Here's one of her garment pins and that's one of her seals flopping up as it was found in the tomb itself. The importance of seals to their owners has survived in a biblical text from the Song of Solomon 8.6, in which the bridegroom tells his beloved, quote, wear me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death, passion cruel as the grave. It blazes up like a blazing fire, fiercer than any flame, end of quote. What this means is that since seals were so personal, they were not handed down, but were buried with you. So if you were worn as the seal upon someone's heart and therefore buried with that person, you would be together for eternity and your love would indeed transcend death. Excavations in southern Mesopotamia at the biblical city Erech called Uruk by its ancient inhabitants uncovered the remains of what must have been magnificent mud brick temples datable to around 3,500 to 3,300 BC. It was among the remains of these temples that the earliest Mesopotamian cylinder seals and their ancient impressions were found. Some of the earliest seals show repeated rows of animals representing the controlled herds upon which the economy was dependent. On the screen is one of these early seals made out of white marble shown above in several views with a modern impression of the seal itself shown below. It shows three horned animals above two wavy lines, representing perhaps the two rivers of Mesopotamia. At the left is a temple facade. The seal carver has presented nothing less than an ordered view of reality by creating a scheme that represents a distillation of the most important elements of Mesopotamian life. The waters, which bring life, the animals upon which human life depends, and the temple, the economic, social, and spiritual center of these earliest communities, all preserved on a stone cylinder, merely an inch high and still readable, and able to communicate to us today some 5,500 years later. Here on the slightly later chloride seal are shown three majestically horned stags, Notice how the idea of three elements is prevalent so early on. Also notice the emerging sense of design with the pattern created by the horns of the animals across the top of the seal. But notice also in the seal itself, how the carving of the animal of the horns follows the curve of the round stone. And there's also motion implied in the cylinder seal as well. All three animals, although they look superficially alike are not. The back one, the legs are together, the middle one, they're further apart, and the one in the front are even further apart, emphasizing this idea of motion as you turn the seal in your hand. The design, I feel, would be at home in turn of the center of Vienna among the designs of the Wiener Werkstatt. This idea of movement that I just mentioned is further, is further evolved in this still slightly later seal, which I only show an impression. The entire scene of animals has been reduced to a series of arcs and curves. These are the horns, these arcs and curves for the body and the legs. It's all been reduced, as I said, to the series of arcs and curves to give a sense of the herd of animals bounding across the sea, bounding across the field itself. And you can imagine the beautiful freeze this would make if you rolled it out several times. The seal carver has been a able to achieve a simplicity and vitality that even Matisse would have admired as expressed through his late cutouts. The Uruk period around 3300 BC, more complex imagery evolves. This seal is made of a large piece of serpentine and at the center here is the earliest known representation of a Cyclops hero here shown in detail. A pair of confronting lions stands on his shoulders. There are the tails and the bodies, the legs standing on his head, so his shoulders. And then he grasps two other lions by their hind legs and their heads are down here and they're trying to grasp at his legs. The lions that he grasps symbolize the chaotic power of the natural world. Their domination emphasizes the hero's legendary strength and prowess. The heraldic scheme signifies the control of nature itself. 
elements that need containment to ensure survival. Notice how the whole design scheme is tightly formed by a series of cascading, what I call W shapes, starting here with the lions on top of the tail, the body, the legs, the leg, the body. And then the next tier goes this way. And then down at the bottom with the lions, the legs, legs and the lions, this very tightly organized heraldic scheme. On the left of the Cyclops, a magnificently little horned animal sits in the boat. There's the horned animal. There's his head and the horns. A lion-headed eagle swoops down below. And on the other side, another horned animal. You see it's the same one that's on the left. You see those beautiful, elegant horns. Is actually standing, I think, like a human, steadying a boat in which another animal is casting a net. And above, another lion-headed eagle. Hybrid animals, as well as animals acting as humans, an act of imagination that underpins all animal fables, suggest a culture at the dawn of history with well-developed myths in which animals play a central role. Now, the emerging urban communities characteristic of this era slowly over a period of 100 years grew into powerful Sumerian temple states competing with each other for dominance over Southern Mesopotamia. This phase of Mesopotamian history is called the early dynastic period, so-called for, for the dynasties of Sumerian rulers established in the, these now great cities, such as Lagash, Kish, Ur, Nippur, and so on. By the later phase of this early dynastic period around 2600 BC, writing, had been in use in Mesopotamia for some five to 600 years. By this time, Southern Mesopotamia was dotted with 20 to 30 temple states, each dominated by a temple to a specific God. One of the preferred subjects for seals of this later phase of the early dynastic period is the so-called contest scene, where domesticated animals are no longer grazing peacefully, but are involved in a conflict with wild animals, often with a hero coming to the aid of the domesticated animals. This rich lapis lazuli seal inscribed for a prince shows a contest scene of six interconnected figures creating a frieze starting from the left, the hero here grabbing the tail and wielding a dagger against this feline attacking a stag with a hero embracing, protecting the stag, embracing another, protecting another stag with a lion coming in from the right trying to bite the head of the stag. all combined together on this beautiful lapis seal. A further example also of lapis lazuli shows an attacking lion biting the neck of its victim and grasping the victim's neck with its paw as it does in nature. But here our seal carver adds drama to the scene by showing the lion's head from above, emphasizing the curve of the powerful neck with flame-like tufts of the mane. So this is the lion crossing, biting the neck, of the, uh, the bull and the lion's head from above, you know, biting, grasping these beautiful flame-like tufts of the mane. The subject of the seal figures fighting animals, specifically lions, was already ancient by the time this seal was carved. The same subject meant different things in successive periods. The earliest surviving representation of this subject comes from around 7,000 BC. What is the original meaning of the scene? Well, around 8,000 BC, you have the final domestication of cattle. And when you have domesticated cattle, you have an animal strong enough for pulling a plow, which leads to wide-scale agriculture. When you progress to this stage, you start encroaching on the natural territory of wild animals, such as lions. And as we know from Africa today, lions are basically lazy animals that prefer to attack domesticated animals old people or children, because it is easy. Among the earliest images we have from Mesopotamia is such a scene. On the screen is a modern drawing of an ancient painting, again dating to around 7,000 BC. And it is on a vessel, hopefully still in the Mosul Museum in Iraq. The scene is painted on the inside of a clay vessel's outward sloping walls. If you looked down inside the vessel, you would see the scene as a single image joined at these two ends. 
And this is the what's on the bottom of the vessel. It's a stepped altar. This is the altar looking at it from the side. The scene shows a hero with a bow and arrow attacking, uh, attacking a lion who has a calf in his paws. And the hero is protecting the community itself, which is represented by two female weavers and a cow. This is a, a fringed garment that these two women are holding up between them. They have wonderful flowing long hair and clearly identified by their prominent pubic triangles. To date, this is perhaps the earliest surviving narrative scene in Mesopotamian art. Its subject is a real threat to the daily existence of the community. Some 4,000 years later, by the time of the early dynastic Sumerian temple states that we've been looking at, the representation has developed into a frieze of interconnected figures as we have seen on this seal at the bottom. However, now the threat of an attacking lion is no longer a specific reality. And the same basic subject matter of the early vessel painting has evolved into something much more conceptual. It now represents one of the great mythical dramas of Sumerian religion. That is the eternal struggle between the forces of order and chaos. The lions representing the chaos of the natural world with the domesticated animals and man representing the forces of order and the struggle to impose order on the world around them. In the scene on the seals, the battle is never clearly resolved. The Sumerians knew already then that this very struggle between order and chaos was and is constant. And how fitting to carve this image on a cylindrical surface that when rolled, the scene would endlessly repeat itself. Here is another example of this on this beautiful marble seal. One sees the frieze of uninterrupted figures with the emphasis on the struggle itself expressed through the design. Here are our two cross lines, these wonderful back-to-back -back manes. They're biting the necks of these two bulls. There's a bull man coming in to aid and a leopard here and a gigantic threatening scorpion up in the field. A Southern Mesopotamia was not around 2450 BC when its temple states were conquered and brought into the so-called Akkadian Empire. The Akkadian period takes its name from Agade, the royal city built by Sargon, the first king of a Semitic dynasty who overthrew the early dynastic Sumerian princes of Southern Mesopotamia and set up his rule over the entire country. Probably for the purposes of securing the trade routes into their country, Sargon and his successors made military expeditions into Persia, Northern Syria, and even Asia Minor. And then, as now, the reasons for such military expeditions were, quote, to protect their national interests, end of quote. Thus, the first empire of the ancient Near East was established, though it was of a relatively short duration from about 2430 to 2150 BC, or around 190 years. Before the Akkadians achieved this political ascendancy, they had been living side by side in southern Mesopotamia with the Sumerians. Therefore, no sudden break occurred in the cultural development of the country. Nevertheless, in the years ascribed to Sargon's reign, a fundamental change took place in Mesopotamian art, the dreamlike interconnected designs of the Sumerians that we are looking at were succeeded by dynamic, realistic works. A different treatment of space developed since more room was needed for the often violent action of the muscular figures of the Akkadian designs. This is the art of empire. What is clearly stressed is power through strength. Among the more elegant seals with this subject is this example carved in serpentine in a very mature Akkadian style. At the left is a nude bearded hero grappling with a water buffalo whose face has been damaged. At the right, a bull man whose lower part is bull and upper part is a man wrestling with a lion. The nude bearded hero on the left stands as the tallest figure in the scene. His almost mask-like visage directly faces the viewer becoming the focus of the, of the entire scene and emphasizing the figure's power and importance. With remarkable detail, especially considering the small scale of the actual seal, about an inch high, the Akkadian carver was able to represent the arm muscles of the hero clearly flexed 
from the tensions of his actions. As with the water buffalo and the lion, the animal portions of the bull man's body was carved here, here, and here with great sensitivity to an understanding of the musculature beneath the hide of the animal. Each is rendered as uniquely as it is in nature. The treatment of the lion is particularly compelling. No longer represented as the aggressor of Sumerian art, the lion's head is thrown back in profile with its uh, mouth wide open and its sharp teeth exposed, roaring in rage and impotence and frustration at being dominated. The lion's paw firmly grasped at its wrist by the bull man shows the claws extended but splayed and ineffectual. Through the strength of the hero and the bull man, the natural world represented by the lion and the water buffalo is controlled. The Cadian artists express this most clearly through the use of gestures. The stylized lozenge effect created by the arms here and legs of the contesting pairs serves to stress the subjugation of the animals. This combination of an extraordinary attention to naturalistic detail, such as the musculature of the arms of the hero with the stylistic inventions, such as the angularity of the arms gestures, creates a visual tension that is one of the most original achievements of the Akkadian artists. Notice the tree here on a mountain. The tree stylized in a mountain here has a long life. Uh, it can be seen on these Assyrian reliefs some 2000 years later, the mountains and the stylized tree as seen here, and even picked up by Klimt from seeing the Assyrian reliefs once they arrived in Europe in the 19th century and incorporated in his painting of Judith with the head of Holofernes. Here's our mountains and our tree hiding behind Judith's neck, copied right out of the Assyrian reliefs. It is in the Akkadian period that the gods identified by the distinguished horns crowns are shown mostly for the first time in their various mythological settings. Among the more dramatic scenes glorifying the gods created by the Akkadian artists are those depicting the storm or weather god. On this seal carved in shell, the storm god here is shown with great difficulty trying to rein in the, uh, the lion griffin. Standing on the lion's griffin back between the two wings is the naked consort of the weather god, both wearing their horn crowns, and she's holding the water courses or the reins of the, uh, of the storm as it approaches across the landscape. At the left, a worshiper pours a libation over an altar in homage to the gods. The calm stance of the worshiper as he performs his pious ritual is in sharp contrast to the drama of the depiction of the gods. The head of the lion griffin here bows down as it roars and spews forth thunder and lightning. Certainly on the Circadian seal, the artist has evoked the raging storm magnificently as it makes its steady inevitable progress through the flat land. On this black serpentine seal, the water god Ea is represented is identified by a vase right here, which he holds at his chest from which two water streams flow representing the Tigris and the Euphrates. Here's one stream and here's the other. Ea is shown enthroned in an enclosure representing his home thought to be at the bottom of the freshwater ocean below the earth called the Apsu. The enclosure appears to be made of water as it is a continuation of the streams flowing from Ea's bays. Therefore, it is probably meant to be seen from above as a moat-like structure in which the god sits. At the corners, the water courses make loops. You see here, 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 and here. This may be seen as a precursor of the guillotine pattern shown on the left, a symbol turning in on itself representing the idea of eternity and indeed a precursor of our symbol itself of infinity. Ea is also the God of wisdom and perhaps the watery enclosure is a visual metaphor for wisdom as essential as water flowing for all eternity. Standing before Ea is his divine vizier who has two faces and simultaneously looks to the past and to the future. On the screen at the left is a fragment of a mold and its impression is on the right though not a seal, is clearly the work of a most accomplished seal carver. 
It was on view at the Metropolitan Museum in the Art of the First Cities exhibition and is published in that catalog. It will be featured in the Morgan exhibition in the fall of 2022. Even though, ex ex even though executed on a small scale, it is less than five inches high, this fragmentary mold demonstrates another aspect of the complex iconography developed by the Acadian artists, this time for expressing not a mythological setting for a god, but a real setting for an actual living god. The one fragment that is, that is preserved by the fragment shows Ishtar here, here in the mold itself and here in the impression. It shows Ishtar, as I mentioned, the goddess of love and war, as well as the patron goddess of the capital city of Akade. She's seated atop a temple platform. You see the steps going up, there she is seated, and perhaps signifies her own temple in the capital city itself. Like many images of Ishtar, here shown in detail from the mold. Her lower body is depicted in profile and the upper part of her body is shown frontally. Her frontal head fully engages the viewer's attention. The man seated opposite her shown in detail on the left. This is her arm there as they join here, also from the mold. Is he is no ordinary person. He is the great Akkadian king, Naram Sin who due to its exploits takes the unprecedented step in Mesopotamian history to be, to be declared a god in his lifetime. Even though Naramsin is human, he is now a god and he is entitled to sit opposite Ishtar as an equal. Normally it was necessary for a human being, even a king to stand before the enthroned deity. Naramsin is shown as a powerful bearded man with strong, well-defined muscles. To his headgear are attached the horns of divinity. Here are the ones on, on Ishtar, and here are his. In his left hand, he holds a ring. Here is the ring, and here it is here as well, to which four ropes have been attached. Ishtar assists him by grasping his wrist. Here she grasps his wrist, and there it is there. And guiding the ropes that pass behind her with her other hand. Ropes go behind her. There are four, one, two, three, four. The ropes are attached to the nose rings. Not only of two rulers or chieftains standing with their hands shackled on the image of their own particular cities, but also to the nose rings of two mountain gods who emerge from a mountain range and present bowls containing precious minerals and stones of the conquered area of the conquered regions of Ishtar and Naram Sin. Here is one of the mountain gods emerging from the mountain. There's the nose ring. This is the bowl of tributes. This is one of the kings shackled here at his wrist, standing on a temple. And that's the same one here. And this is the other pair of god and shackled king standing on the temple. <clears throat> the scene visually indicates and emphasizes that it is through the goddess Ishtar that Naram Sin has not only conquered one mountainous area, either to the east or north of the capital, but that he also rules the region by the goddess's intervention. Look at how the design is created, the abstract composition behind it. The gods and the kings look almost through Ishtar directly at Naram Sin. He looks directly at Ishtar who confronts you, the viewer. It's a rather sophisticated line of attention. The lost scenes surrounding, there would have been a whole group of scenes creating sort of a half globe-like shape. The lost scenes surrounding the central scene of the mold of which the surviving fragment is perhaps one of nine scenes must have used different iconographies to show other conquered and controlled parts of the empire. As a whole, the object was, was essentially a world map of Naram Sin's empire with the capital city Agade and Naram Sin as its center. Contemporary inscription reads as follows, quote, Naram Sin, the mighty king of Agade, when the four quarters together revolted against him, through the love which the goddess of Ishtar showed him, he was victorious in nine battles in one year, and the king, whom they, the rebels, had raised against him, he captured. In view of the fact that he protected the foundations of his city from danger, his city requested from Ishtar that Naram Sin be the god of their city, and they built within Agade a temple to him 
As for the one who removes this inscription, may the gods tear out his foundation and destroy his progeny, end of quote. Alas, this is not the last example of delusional narcissism to plague humanity. The self-deification of the king ultimately did not go over well. The Akkadian Empire was fraught with assassination and internal strife, and after the death of Naramsin's successor, there is anarchy in the land, and the great king lists record, quote, who was king and who was not king, end of quote. Several more Akkadian kings fell out, of, fell out, and the, fell out, and the dynasty did not last. And they just ruled over smaller and smaller territories until an invasion from the north ends the 190 years of empire of the Akkadians. As remarkable a work of art as this mold is, packed with minute detail usually found on seals, the mold must be seen as a sophisticated example of propaganda. Here, perhaps for the first time, religion is used to justify and provide a moral authority to the ambiguous, at best, morality of conquest and suppression. The Akkadians used religion to justify the abuse of power to secure their empire. And this abuse, with its thankfully inevitable and eventual collapse of this first historical empire, is the lesson of history that has yet to be learned from one empire to the next. After the collapse of the Akkadians, a chaotic dark age descended upon Jamie. However, a few centers of Mesopotamian culture preserved their independence during the, during the domination of invading foreigners. One of these was the city of Lagash in the extreme south. Here reigned a priest king, a priest prince king named Gudea. The seals made at Lagash show a continuation of the high standards of Akkadian art. On this steatite seal from about 2150 BC, post Akkadian, a lion headed eagle has two kneeling mountains mountain goats in its grasp in a heraldic composition that, beautif that, that is really beautifully balanced. The beautifully cut inscription uh, is incorporated into the design and identifies the seal owner and his occupation. The design is so delicately worked and especially in the wings of the lion-headed eagle. Indeed, one gets the feeling of the wings of the majestic creature spreading open before your eyes. After less than a century, the domination of the foreign invaders was broken and the region of their conquest came once again under the rule of a Mesopotamian dynasty, the so-called third dynasty of Ur. Though there is little evidence of great military might of the Akkadians, the influence of the kings of Ur extended through their great commercial and cultural power alone, almost as far as the region subjugated by the Akkadian conquerors. They tried something else. King Urnama was the founding king of the third dynasty of Ur. He was responsible for the restoration of the old temples and oversaw the extensive construction of new temples. Here is King Urnama himself. Although not a seal, the sculpture is worthy of a few comments. Urnama is chiefly remembered today for his legal code, the oldest known surviving example in the world. Two of his early year names state one, the year in which Urnama, the king, put in order the ways of the people in the country from below to above. And two, the year Urnama made justice in the land, end of quote. In other words, Urnama brought order out of chaos by establishing a rule of law. This figure shows Urnama wearing a long skirt rolled to a belt at the waist. On his head, he carries a basket containing mud used to make the bricks of a temple. The first brick of a temple was molded by the king himself, who was here represented in the occupation, which was among the lowliest in Mesopotamia, carrying the basket. For in the presence of the gods, the king was once again but a humble servant. This is in direct contrast to the deified Naram Sin, seated with Ishtar. With Urnama, there is a great restoration period. The proper order of man to the gods has returned. This sculpture is made of solid copper and is slightly over a foot tall. The inscription on this king's skirt down here proudly declares his titles and achievements. Urnama, king of Ur, king of Sumer and of Akkad, the one who built the temple of Enlil, end of quote. This is extremely important because the Akkadians destroyed the Temple of Endel by suppressing an uprising. 
where Nama and his followers thought that because of this and similar acts of desecration, the gods allowed foreigners to invade and end decade an empire. You can understand then the importance to Ornama of being known as the one who built the temple of Enlil. Ornama is shown in an act of deep piety. Notice the, the delicate rendering of the face, the eyes, the very delicate mouth. The negative spaces created by the upraised arms emphasize the face and the piety of the act itself. The sculpture gives us today in the 21st century a rare glimpse of royal portraiture as conceived by first-rate metropolitan craftspeople of the 21st century BC. When the sculpture first came to the Morgan around 1900, it was thought to be a female offering bearer. That is not the case. What is shown for the first time in Mesopotamian art is an image of a king that does not stress strength and military might as we saw with Naram Sin. All of the symbols of his status and of his masculinity have been removed or altered. He is clean shaven, beardless, bare chested. His muscles have been soft. What is stressed now is humility and deference to the divine and as well as to a higher purpose. It is now known that this sculpture was originally placed in the sealed foundation deposit under the gate to the temple of Enlil. By this very sculpture being placed in the ground, it was intended not to be seen during Ornama's lifetime, but to be seen hopefully at some point in the distant future. Ornama wanted us to know that it was his humility that set him apart from the Akkadians, as well as the rule of law. I show you this sculpture not only because it is one of the finest ancient Mesopotamian sculptures in the Western Hemisphere and on view at the Morgan, but because it epitomizes the profound religious feeling of the third dynasty of Ur, expressed in the characteristic motive of the cylinder seals of the period, depicting rites of worship in the temples. On this jasper seal, a deity is shown, shown enthroned on the right. Here he is and a worshiper is being led in by an interceding goddess. The image of a divine male being is beautifully conveyed by the upright posture, the long flowing beard, and the steady open eye fully sculpted in profile. Remarkable to the scene is the interaction of the figures expressed through their gestures and specifically their hands as the god acknowledges, the goddess acknowledges, and the seal owner is being brought in shows deference to the God, almost creating a, a pyramid effect of these interacting hands. <laughs> However, like the Akkadians, the third dynasty of Ur collapsed after about 200 years, and there followed again several hundred years of internal strife. Not until after 1800 BC did Hammurabi of Babylon reestablish an empire in Mesopotamia. Since the discovery of his famous law code in 1901, the top part on the left and currently in the Louvre, Hammurabi has been well known to students of law. An excerpt from the prologue, often overlooked, characterizes the spirit in which the code was written. I quote, the gods called me, Hammurabi, to create justice in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evil, to prevent the strong from oppressing the weak, end of quote. This is the first time such humanitarian thought had ever been expressed. The impressive number of seals produced during the period is largely due to a law in the code, which requires that every transaction had to be noted in writing and sealed in order to be valid. You can clearly see in the scene at the top of the code that it is derived from the seals of the previous period that we saw on the right. However, great Hammurabi on the left needs no interceding goddess to present him to the seated god. One of the most profound seals of the period is this hematite seal of a woman revealing herself. For, the ancient, for ancient Mesopotamia, the act of procreation symbolized creation. A female figure is revealing only her pubic area as if to emphasize this area of, pro of procreation as creation rather than mere carnality and lust. Notice how the hand of the male figure brought to his mouth here brought to his mouth here. And the downward stretched arm at his back here emphasize his reaction of astonishment at the truth being revealed to him through the generosity of the female's gesture. 
he is clearly visually taken aback. Notice also the empty space between them, which emphasizes the gestures of each. The entire scene takes place framed by a peaceable kingdom above and below of natural and mythological animals in harmony, divided by the, the guillot pattern that I mentioned earlier. Here, the pattern represents water flowing around and back on itself as a symbol of eternity. The truth expressed in the scene is eternal. The whole visual, the whole is a remarkable visual conception. It brings to mind Corbet's The Source of the World. This is the same idea on the cylinder seal. The order of the Babylonians comes to an end with the destruction of Babylon in 1595, but by a raid from the Hittites in the north and Anatolia. With this, the chaos of another dark age descended once again upon Mesopotamia. Not until the emergence of the Assyrians in the 14th century BC as a political power did a period of cultural flowering and exchange return to Mesopotamia. The rise of Assyria in the north of Mesopotamia foreshadowed the Assyrian world empire of the first millennium BC. The finest cylinder seal style developed during the 14th and 13th centuries BC. The Assyrian kings had outstanding seal cutters at their courts. These artists created a new naturalism in the landscape elements and a vitality in the modeling of the figures imparting a sense of realism to their designs. This may reflect the general artistic trend towards realism that characterized Egypt and the Aegean during this period, the first truly international age in the so-called Western tradition. This seal, a beautiful milky chalcedony, shows a stag leaping in a landscape. A gnarled tree, perhaps an olive tree, is placed on a hill with a bird right here, uh, placed among a group of flowers growing beside it. The stag is suspended in motion descending from the hill. Uh, one leg is still held horizontally after the initial spring downwards. The artist who carved the stag, its antlered head proudly held high and four legs poised to land, must have been familiar with the extraordinary grace and dignity of this animal, whose name Lulimu could also mean ruler or prince. The significance of the scene is unknown. However, an echo of its meaning is surely to be found in a biblical text from the Song of Solomon 2, 8, 9, in which the bride speaks of the bridegroom's love. Quote, the voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. End of quote. Holland Carter, art critic for the New York Times, has described the image on the seal in particular. Quote, a leaping stag carved around 1300 BC is a masterpiece of sculptural relief. The animal's startled eyes and taut muscles are caught with exquisite, not a stroke, wasted naturalism. Two trees that flank him are near abstract bursts of lime, midair explosions, talk about eloquence, end quote. This also Middle Assyrian seal from the 13th century BC is remarkable not only for the striking image of a lion attacking a mouflon, but for the complexity of the stone itself, a beautiful white and banded agate. On this complex surface, the seal carver has captured the ferocity of the roaring lion with a series of arcs and curves with the rounded modeled muscles of the, of the, of the lion, emphasized by these linear striations. Uh, the, Carver has also captured a real sense of fear in the face of the mouflon as its head is turned back towards its attacker and one of its front legs is poised for the animal to leap up and bound away. All carved, you can hardly see the carving on this very difficult but beautifully patterned natural occurring in the stone itself. This modeled gray serpentine, this modeled gray limestone, excuse me seal, is perhaps the most striking of all. A male figure pursues an ostrich here, possibly representing the earthly equivalent of the griffin, thought to be the conveyor of death. The hero raises his right hand and swings a sword. The raised hand is the starting point for a strong diagonal line around which the artist has balanced the composition with great subtlety, starting here through the shoulders, arms, tail feathers, body, and leg, right down through the seal. <clears throat> In the figure of the ostrich, the artist has achieved great expressiveness. 
the fleeing bird with its head turned back in fear and fury at the attacker and its feathers bristling with anger, ranks as one of the greatest figures of animals in Mesopotamian art. I remind you that the seal is no more than an inch high. In a biblical text from the Old Testament in the book of Job 39, 13, 17, the ostrich is considered a malevolent creature because it disdains its young. This passage may help us to interpret the presence of the young ostrich here on the seal and sort of being kicked off by the adult and further to add to our understanding of the, uh, the seal itself. Uh, this black serpentine seal from the beginning of the first millennium BC is an example from the later Assyrian period, something known as the linear style. This bull here with its head down is carved with a graver with a masterful economy of line, yet it's full of expressiveness in its simplicity. It took Picasso a lifetime to achieve this kind of simplicity of line as shown in the ceramics. And these dots represent the Pleiades. And around 612 BC, at the end of our sequence, Nabopolassar, king of the Chaldean dynasty of Babylon and father of the Nebuchadnezzar, participated in an alliance of foreigners to, to defeat Assyria. This ancient coalition of the willing brought about the destruction of Assyria's two great cities, Asher and Nineveh. Yet, less than 60 years later, or sorry, less than 80 years later, the Persian king Cyrus the Great defeated the last Babylonian, uh, the last ruler of the Babylonian Empire. And Babylon, along with the entire ancient empire that spread throughout Mesopotamia, became a mere province of Persia. And this is the end of Mesopotamia as a political force. In general, the Persian Jews seals only for official purposes. For private use, they employed stamp seals mounted in rings, a practice still in use to this day. Even though cylinder seals had been carved in Mesopotamia for over 3,000 years, the form was by no means exhausted. Some of the most exquisite cylinders were produced at the end of the tradition in the Persian workshops. And this uh, banded agate seal, from Persia. It is no longer the new bearded hero of the Sumerians and the Akkadians dominating animals, but the Persian king himself in a beautifully balanced yet artificial composition where all the elements are subservient to and are a reflection of the king's majesty. And finally, this remarkable honey colored chalcedony seal showing simply a striding bull. What I find so compelling about this seal is that the Mesopotamians have been carving these animals for thousands of years and are still able to create a thing of originality, simplicity, and beauty. Cylinder seals were in use until the defeat of the last Persian king by Alexander the Great in 330 BC. They no longer had a function as parchment and papyrus replaced clay tablets and the centers of empire shifted. Nevertheless, they remain a valuable artistic record of Mesopotamian pract artistic practices, and they reveal a great deal about the political, social, religious, and cultural developments of ancient Mesopotamia. Many of the images survived as symbols of human qualities and intellectual concepts in the regions and the religious and poetic literature of ancient Western Asia, including the Old Testament. Through the Old Testament as the medium of verbal tradition, much of the symbolism continued into the imagery of the Middle Ages of Europe and beyond. On the screen is a mosaic depicting one of the earliest surviving representations of the Last Supper. It is in Ravenna in San Apollinare Nuovo and dates to around 530 AD. The story is told vividly and directly with Christ on one side and Judas on the other. Uh, with the heads of the apostles gradually turning to face Judas. And here above is the same subject as painted by Tintoretto, finished months before his death in San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. 1,000 years separate these two pictures. The doctrine of transubstantiation, mystery of the rite of communion, had been debated from the 13th century to the 15th century and was finally incorporated into the document of the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century. The mystery of this rite is what is the subject of Tintoretto's picture with its corporeal apparitions of angelic creatures and mysterious light source. The narrative of the mosaic shown below gives way to the doctrine embodied by the painting. 
representing a tremendous evolution of human experience, thought, and belief over a period of a thousand years. The same concept of evolution of human experience, thought, and belief must also be applied to the over 4,000 years that separate this narrative image above, representing the immediate concerns of our beginnings in agricultural communities from this image below, representing the eternal struggle between order and chaos, as well as the approximately 1,800 years that separate this seal from this example below with which we started from the seventh century BC, where the subject has been entirely removed from the natural world and suggests the broader concept of protection from a theoretical threat to an empire. I will leave you with this. There is a remarkable passage in the Old Testament where the actual rolling of a cylinder seal on clay is due to describe the landscape emerging from the darkness at dawn. It is among the Lord's admonitions to Job 38, 12 to 18, quote, in all your life, have you ever called up the dawn or shown the morning its place? Have you taught it to grasp the fringes of the earth and shake the dog's dart from its place to bring up the horizon in relief as clay under a seal until all things stand out like the folds of a cloak. Thank you for allowing me to share this material with you all this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. That was, wow. Okay, thank you. Um, fantastic. Uh, I, everyone, I see some questions in and uh, it would just take a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have a question, please do put it in the Q and A, and that's where I'll I'll look. So uh, if you can do that instead of the chat, um, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, it was a whirlwind tour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just yeah, really incredible. Um, I had no idea the. Um, uh, let's see. Linda Darling um, is asking, is there a relationship between the form of the Mesopotamian seals and Trajan, Trajan's column in 113 CE in Rome? In an early image, he remarked on a seal that depicted a staircase to an altar. And this is actually an, an architectural feature of the interior of this monument to a celebrated battle. If, if there are discernments to expand understanding between the images material of the seals and the marble of the column that would be interesting including the continuous narrative well a mess of in, it's in it's in mesopotamia where you first get these ideas of continuous narrative in fact you could think of every single seal as a section of trajan's column with a continuous the scene on the seal is a continuous narrative but even closer to the column of Trajan, which an object I did not show you tonight, but which a uh, uh, plaster cast will be coming to the exhibition in October 22. And the original is in Baghdad, is the great vessel from Uruk, which shows different registers of, of the, so the whole order of the world, starting with rivers at the bottom, then a register showing plants, then offering bears bringing offerings, and the top register with the temple. This idea of the narrative is extremely important to all cultures. And what I find remarkable, as with many things with Mesopotamia, that this is the time when these things are first expressed and they survive on these little cylinder seals. As far as the altar on the inside of the vessel, that's a, I hadn't thought about the altar on the inside of the column of Trajan. That's a wonderful parallel. I will keep that in mind and thank you for bringing that up. But again, each think of each seal as a continuous narrative scene. Thank you for that question, I appreciate it. I always like these connections between vastly different periods of time and cultures. Um, this question is from Burton. Uh, they ask, how many seals roughly have survived? Is the level of detail in the examples you have provided typical of what is extent? extent? How far down the social scale would these have been used? It's a wonderful question. Um, we guess there's about 30,000 seals known, but that's a guess. But there are 
untold numbers of ancient impressions that survive of, 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 uh, of, the, of, you, of, of these used impressions of which I showed you one. And so far, we have only been able to match up two known seals with an ancient impression. So remember that three, for 3,000 years, these were used, not handed down. Each person had their own. So there must be untold numbers. And many of them, some of them are also carved down and recarved. Uh, you can even find fragments of them, the people in, in necklaces, things like that, once they lost their association with a particular individual. And yes, they go down through the social scale. Uh, the one I showed you, which I alluded to towards the end of the simplicity of Picasso, is a seal I'm very fond of, but many of my colleagues would think that that is a poor quality of a seal. I don't think so. I think it's a beautiful, realized, even in the lower scale, although there are some that are extremely crude and made out, made out of very soft and relatively, I would guess, uh, more readily available stones. The finest, of course, are in these harder stones like the lapis lazuli and the rock crystals and things like that, which I've showed you tonight. I wanted to show you some of the more beautiful seals tonight to try and capture your, your imaginations, but they do run the gamut of quality. But again, uh, beauty is in the eye of the holder. That seal that I showed you reminiscent of the simplicity of Picasso, I find beautiful and really compelling. So uh, one, you have to take them you, you have to consider them for, their, for, their, for what they are themselves and to sort of appreciate them on their own and not try to put our own value systems on them, appreciate them for the craft and the work of art of the period that produced them. And again, thank you for that question. Um, this question comes from Daniel. Uh, they're wondering, do you have a sense of whether there were larger more public images in ancient Mesopotamia? And how might have that pictorial language of the seals been taught and learned? That's a good, great question. The problem with the larger images is that uh, the buildings, of course, are mud brick. So much of that is not made out of stone. There certainly were larger images. You may, may or may not be aware of the great stone stele of Naram Sin, the king I showed you on the mole that was found uh, in, in, in Iran. And the reason why that survived is that it was taken as war booty from Mesopotamia to its location in Iran, or I forget, in, in, the, in around the first millennium BC. But uh, very little monumental sculpture survives. There are fragments that do. Uh, at a certain, I mean, I, I've always felt that the designs on the cylinder seals up until a certain point were created specifically for the seals themselves. And about the time of the Babylonian period, I didn't show you too many examples of those. I think some of the seals tend to then reflect larger compositions, uh, perhaps decorations in palaces or, or temples. Uh, but again, the, some of the later seals, I think it's again, the design is specifically made for this small scale. How they were handed down or passed down is very difficult to say. I assume seals were found and copied. I know that the Middle Assyrian seal carvers of around 1200 BC did have access or did see Akkadian seals of a thousand years earlier and were trying to imitate the beautiful uh, uh, musculature and anatomy on those seals. Uh, it's also interesting that we have not found any workshops, of any cylinder seal carvers, nor can we put together from the corpus of known cylinder seals, any, 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 any uh, recognized hand of a seal carver. I guess that's because too few have been found. Uh, don't forget that um, the high ground in Mesopotamia are these city mounds. And what's been contained in those city mounds would be the administrative and temple structures and the elites. And down below in the fields and that have been plowed and irrigated and marched through by soldiers for thousands of years are where we would have lived and the uh, steel workshops, et cetera. So none of that has been survived. And to date, only about one or two or three trial pieces have been found of, uh, of, of, of scenes on small pieces of stone that reflect what would have been then carved on a cylinder seal. But don't forget that these stones 
the stone, the raw materials themselves were extremely precious because they came from somewhere else. So that the fact that, that, that you couldn't, you really sort of had to know what you were doing before you were allowed to get onto the seal itself. So the manufacture of them must have been really quite specialized. I don't know if that really answers. I, I hope I've answered your question. I think so. And um, so, so is there any inclination of of how the so the carvers were really specialists, and um, yes. and is so there's no real idea if they had a um, if they had a, a workshop or if they were just sought after individuals. I I, I can't answer that. We I just, I would just, the assumption is as with most crafts and trades in history, in earlier phases anyway, that that was passed down to the gen from generation to generation. But again, none of that can be proven. There are a few examples of cylinder seals that have inscriptions on them, where it is related that the owner is a seal carver. So that evidence that these people certainly existed. As far as the workshops, again, there's no evidence, we just don't have them nor is there any evidence of what tools were used. Uh, a number of years ago at the Morgan Library, I had a workshop where we had a, we were using lapis lazuli from Afghanistan and we cheated. We used electric hobby drills, but we used copper drill bits, which is rather soft <clears throat> and tried to carve into the lapis lazuli. It took me two days to get off, to make a hole in a piece of lapis lazuli with my electric drill and my bit of copper which made me to think that perhaps it was not so much the drill bit that was important, but how, how firm it was. And they could have probably made a piece of wood even firmer by, impregnate, by uh, impreg impregnating it with, um, I don't know, some kinds of bits of stone. I, re I really don't know. It was a mystery to me how that was done. And it made me appreciate the designs even more when I tried to do it myself. Amazing. And in lapis lazuli, that's that's the stone that you amazing. Um, Erica is wondering. Uh, she says, "Thank you so much. So wonderful. Curious. What is the significance of the humans with animal legs or animals standing in a similar upright human-like stance?" Well, the significance of the humans uh, are had these hybrid creatures of the sort of the bull man is an important figure in Mesopotamian mythology. Uh, we don't know exactly what he represents. Sometimes it's thought that he may represent Enkidu, who is Gilgamesh's companion, who is the half wild man who is tamed by civilization through Gilgamesh. And as far as the animals standing in as humans, like the one on the screen we're looking at now, uh, animals like this acting in a human way are either be shown to be mythological creatures and have or creatures out of fables, or in this case, they have a demonic quality as, as they are, as this one is shown, striding forward with its, ex, with its extended claws as a demon, demonic figure, uh, adding to its demonic threat by giving him human powers as well as animal powers. Are the, um, you mentioned this, you showed the, the seal with the Pleiades, are there other records of, I mean, is that a common occurrence to have um, constellations and, and what might they mean? The Pleiades is the most frequent composition on seals of that period. Um, and it's the most visible in the ancient sky. And it also had to do with the cycles of the season and when to plow. So it was a very important constellation. Um, there's, on, there's a seal in the Morgan Library on view from the old Babylonian period around 1800 BC that actually has the first image of Aquarius anywhere in the world. And that's another one of these rare compositions. But, but don't, uh, but we keep in mind that when the Greeks first encountered the Babylonians, the Greeks now, Kurt, they were overwhelmed by coming across 700 years of records of monitoring the night skies. So our ancient Mesopotamians were very much aware of the constellations and there were extraordinary rituals to do at certain moments when certain constellations were, were visible. And I have on view at the Morgan Library a tablet 
cuneiform tablet that tells you what to do during the eclipse of the moon, which we're all probably going to see, I think, tomorrow or the next night. So, so yes, astronomy was very important, but the one that's most, most, uh, most often occurs on cylinder seals are the Pleiades. Amazing. Um, uh, this is just a comment, but uh, Paula Hornbostel says, I love your reference to Corbet's origin. Uh, Dumont and Lachaise, um, uh, sorry, Lachaise also depicted female sexuality and, of course, looked at the ancient art of Egypt and the Near East. Um, and uh, Rosemary's asking if the types of images differ on seals made on more precious stones versus less precious. Yes, it could, it depends. Um, different techniques could be used on harder stones than on softer stones. Uh, it, it all depends. Yes, the seal we're looking, we're still looking at is a spectacularly hard, it's a very hard stone. It's a magnificent seal. Um, Yes, the answer to that is probably yes. Again, I've tried to show you some of the masterpieces at the Morgan Library, but there are many other beautiful seals at the library also on view, not just the ones I showed you tonight. But yes, uh, the hard stones, uh, such as this, there's all kinds of techniques are used. There's the drill that you can see here for all the dots and then the, the graver is all the different kinds of techniques. Some seals only have uh, minimal uh, tool marks. One of the first seals I showed you of the three animals approaching the temple was done simply with a drill and a graver, sort of connecting the dots, but it still had a wonderful vitality to it. So even with the, uh, even with the lesser stones or the, and the less, and, or you may assume the, the fewer tools used, there's still a compelling sense of, de of design that is characteristic of all these seals, regardless of the quality. And that I find rather profound. Um, this has been extraordinary. Maybe time for, for one more question, if that's all right. Um, uh, Andrea, uh, and this alludes to the show coming up, so maybe a good one to end on. Um, Andreas asks, I have a question in regards to Inhed Duana's seal. It is now believed the seal attributed to her hairdresser is her own. The British Museum says it's an Inhed Duana seal. Her seal shows a lapis lazuli relief contest scene very similar to the first lapis lazuli shown. Why would Inhed Duana have a seal of the old contest scene and not a newer style seal? And then did people have different seals throughout their life? Those are all wonderful questions and I thank you for them. And there's, there's, a, there's a point I'm making in the exhibition. I will, I will have that very seal that you referenced, but the very, it's, a, it's an extremely important point to make about these seals. There's a, about four seals that are associated with an Ahinduana uh, that have survived. And I'm not sure the one in the British Museum that either it's, not sure if that really is certain that it's her seal, but it's certainly part of her entourage. And it's important to the, what's very important is that the seals associated with her, with her name on them, either that of her scribe or hairdresser or major domo, are using the subject matter of an earlier period specifically because Enheduana is trying to show a continuity with the past. In fact, we don't know her original name. She's, take, she's an Akkadian princess, but she's using, and is a Sumerian name. She's taking the name of us. She's assuming a Sumerian name. They're trying to show, she and her father are trying to show continuity with the past so that there is no break. And they're doing it symbolically through these designs on the cylinder seals. And I think that's a very important point. Uh, that this can be done visually. That's how sophisticated people were looking at these cylinder seals. I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, it was, uh, did, did people have different seals oh, yes. throughout their life? Yes, there, 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 are some, there are some examples. Of, there are a few examples, very few, 
of seals of people who have attained different status in their life. There's a seal of a man who was the scribe of uh, the crown prince. Then he has another seal when that crown prince becomes king. And then he has another seal when the crown prince makes him a governor. <laughs> so that's what a very rare example. But since there is an example of that, it is probably the case that there were more examples of that in the past. Sydney, thank you so much. This has been com completely fascinating. And um, I expect all the studio school students to be headed to the Morgan to see these objects in real life. <laughs> um, and uh, really just looking forward already to the exhibition next year and um, our chance to experience that in person. Um, and I, I hope at that point we can um, follow up with a proper dinner and uh, welcome <laughs> you onto A Street. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Sydney, the last words to you. This has been my great pleasure to share this with the studio school and all that you do is so important at the school. You, know, you are the future. You people are gonna keep us all looking at fine art for generations to come. And thank you for allowing me to share this ancient material with you all tonight. Thank you.